Welcome to Legacy. My name's Gary, lead pastor here. We have a wonderful team. Come on, give it up for Patty and Jose there. I mean, <laughs> always appreciate the team and uh, thank God for what he's doing here. I want to also, I want to say, I kind of peeked out the window and thank you for your patience in our parking area. How many of you would agree we've, we've thoroughly outgrown our parking lot? And so thank you for, we've tried to do some things too. If you park in the library to make the walk here a little more pleasant and, uh, and actually know where you're going and all of that. And so, uh, but thank you for uh, your patience with that. And well, we have a lot to talk about related to that. We won't do that today, uh, but uh, there, is a, there is a building and there's a large parking lot in that future building. So thank you, Jesus, right? We'll talk about that later. But if you're taking notes, we are in a series entitled The Upside Down Kingdom. Today's message, uh, a glorified Jesus. And uh, that may not get a lot of hits on uh, YouTube, and that's okay. But there, here's a subtitle I want to give you if you take notes, and that is, Beware a Comfortable Jesus or a Safe Jesus. Beware a Comfortable Jesus or a Safe Jesus. We're uh, walking through the book of Mark and uh, sort of at a kind of 15,000 foot level, maybe a little lower. We're not able, to, we're not going through it necessarily verse by verse, but uh, really just trying to capture the flavor in the heart of, of the book of Mark. Uh, this, this book uh, is written, really one of the first gospels written. And uh, Mark and some of the, uh, actually not Mark, but began to hear that some of the early eyewitnesses were dying and some of the early apostles and they realized, you know, we got to write this down. The, the, the spread of the gospel at that, up to that point was orally, verbally, and they needed to write it down. And this was one of those, the first uh, writings of the book of Mark. And if you're looking for a sort of a key uh, passage of well, like what, what's the one passage that really summarizes the book, it would be Mark 10, 45, at least a lot of commentators believe this and it it says this and whoever would be the first Jesus speaking among you must be slave of all doulos servant one who sacrifices for the for the betterment of someone else for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many Jesus came with a radically different message therefore it's an upside down kingdom he gives us a clear picture of what that looks like, that greatness comes by serving and the first are last and the last are first. And we're making our way to Easter Sunday. We're making our way to the cross, through the cross, to Resurrection Sunday together. Today, we're gonna to fast forward to the, to the book of Mark, chapter eight and last part of chapter eight, first part of chapter nine. It's a pivotal, pivotal moment in the life of Jesus and his travels with the disciples. And sort of what we're zooming in on today really is a, is a shift. It's a shift in Mark's writing. It's a shift in what's happening through the gospel. Up to this point, it's, it's who is Jesus? And people trying to figure out, and even his own disciples, like who is this? That even the wind and the waves, of, I mean, who is? And we see a lot of miracles, a lot of things happening uh, through Jesus' life. It's, a, it's establishing who he is, and now we're going to shift to Jesus as the revealed Messiah. Again, he's been casting out demons, healing. Uh, we see Jairus' daughter healed. We see 5,000 plus women and children fed. Uh, some confrontations with the Pharisees and religious leaders. They're giving him, of course, his greatest opposition. He's, he's heading north, so he's in the northern part of Israel. He's up uh, uh, near Mount Hermon or Caesar, and then Caesarea Philippi where, there, where Jesus is confessed as the Messiah and he's working his way. Then from there, he'll be heading south back to Jerusalem where he will fulfill his messianic mission. So he's kind of, it's, it's kind of the trajectory he's going. But right now we're gonna catch him north. And if the disciples attended and were up for an Oscar, Oscar season, right? How many of you watched the Oscars? I don't know. I, I didn't get to see it. It is Oscar season, right? Is it, was it? Yeah, okay, thank you. If they were up for uh, an Oscar, I think P 
Peter could win best supporting actor in a leading role. How many of you would agree with that? Like if they were up for, I mean, he's not the star by any means, but you definitely know he's there. Like there are just certain people are not satisfied to be in the backdrop. They want you to know that they are there. And if there were a movie that, a movie title that depicted Peter's life, I, I, I think, and there's, I was trying to think, like grapple in my mind, like what, what would really capture Peter's kind of life and his story? What, what movie would best capture it? And, I, and it, one comes to mind, and it's an old one, uh, uh, but see if, see if you uh, recall this one. Go ahead there. Now, how many of you, let me just pa- go ahead and hit that, hit the pause button on that. How many of you, that song, be, and be honest, no, no shame here, no shame culture, that means nothing to you. You have no idea, okay? Probably under 25. Uh, that, of course, is a, an old movie, old Clint Eastwood, old Clint Eastwood movie, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. I think that could capture <laughs> Peter's life. Because he had moments that were profoundly good and bad and and ugly. In fact, the reality is we all do, right? Like, man, like we all do. The the, the difference is ours weren't captured in the most popular book in the world, the Bible, and written there and recorded there, like for people to read about over and like your be- like your worst day has been recorded and everybody's going to read it for generations to come. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The good would be, of course, his the messianic confession, where Jesus, Mark eight twenty seven, went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, here it is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus, of course, told, him, told them, Peter said, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. This was an important moment. His identity as the Christ, the anointed one, needed to be clear. And then he warned them not to tell anyone. It's a a huge moment. And and Jesus seizes the moment, and this is really important to capture, to give the first prediction of his suffering and his death. And the reason is there are a lot of misconceptions about what the what type of messiah would be coming there were a lot of false mes- a messiah narratives going around like is this a davidic messiah where he's going to come and he's going to upend uh, the roman government and he's going to come in on a white stallion and jesus immediately defines that and clarifies and he begins to set the ground rules for how he would come what his reign would look like he begins teaching that the son of man must suffer many things be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, ultimately killed. And he elaborates on the cost of discipleship. If anyone wants to follow me, he says, you got to take up your cross daily. You got to lose your life. If you lose your life, you're going to find it. You find, you, right? No one, no one. And, 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 and he's just continuing this message and Peter's listening to it and he's just not having it. Can you just see him in the back listening to Jesus? Like, really? Like, you want to spread this message? Like you gotta, we got we gotta. All right, he's thinking this. Like we gotta lighten this thing up a little. No one's gonna want to follow. We need to keep it positive. Like we need to like let's do the miracle thing again. More signs and wonders. And then in a moment of weakness, <laughs> he pulls Jesus aside because he's gonna correct Jesus. He's gonna step into the. <laughs> He's going to step into the deep end of the pool. And the moment really is way too big for Peter, but he didn't get the memo. And so what he does, he takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him. (laughs) 
I mean, just go there. Think about it. The bad. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Here it is. It's in the Bible, 831 Mark. And he's got to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the scribes, and, and, and he's going to be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he, and he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to, re, he, he began to rebuke him. That's a strong word. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He turns and he sees his disciples, does Peter, or does Jesus, and he rebukes Peter. The disciples are looking at their teacher. They're trying to get their cues here. What, what, what is this bad? Is it good? What, what and Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me. And if you want to complete the trifecta, we'll stop the music. But uh, the ugly was just go fast forward to uh, the, the fire that where he's sitting there with the slave girl and he denies Jesus knowing him three times. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But these rebukes get me. These, these rebukes, after Jesus rebukes Peter, he points out a fatal flaw that in all of us, it, it's actually, it's visible in all of us. It surfaces from one time, or well, you be the judge if it surfaces at one time or another in your life. Here it is, Mark 8, 33. But turning and seeing Jesus, or seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. Here it is. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Don't raise your hands, but have you, anybody ever done that? The message paraphrase really catches this in a way that feels more like a gut punch. You gotta like, you gotta like this. But Peter grabbed him, here it is, in protest. Turning and seeing his disciples wavering, Jesus, wondering what to believe, Jesus confronted Peter. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. Can you, re can you, can you relate to that? You ever had the Holy Spirit say to you, maybe in your heart or maybe through a trusted pastor or a friend, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You ever had that said to you? You ever felt that in your heart? When you hear that, that's code for, what are you doing? Your focus is off. You're wrapped up in base things. You're, you're wrapped up in pop culture. You're wrapped up uh, in what pop culture is fixated on. You're, you're wrapped up in, in, in nonsensical thinking. Your rationale is tainted and limited by the confines of your human framework and your human mindset. You've lost sight of how God works and you're navigating on your own. Maybe you've heard that as related to your marriage. Culture says one thing, but the question is, what's Jesus saying about what you're thinking about? Related to your kids, what's best for, your, for their spiritual well-being? I know what secular leading psychologists are telling you, but what is God saying? What's best for their spiritual formation? What about your retirement? I, I, what, what, what does God say about your time, talent, and treasure? I know what AARP says. You owe it to yourself. I know, and maybe you do. But have you consulted with God? Have you considered you're part of an upside-down kingdom? Young ladies, that man you're attracted to at school, he's so cute. And yes, the other girls are jealous, and yes, he doesn't know Jesus. And quite frankly, he's more interested in your body. Hear the warning of Jesus to Peter. You're not setting your mind on things of God, but on man. Beware, is he a Christ follower? To the students in the room, yes, culture says it's cool to disrespect your parents, to roll your eyes and talk back, but in the upside down kingdom, we're called to honor them. Imagine that. To respect them, for this is right, the Bible says. There's a promise attached, you'll live long on the earth. What about your career path or your finances? This is the upside-down kingdom. 
So it's going to look different. There's a cost. There's a sacrifice. There's going to be things and thoughts and processes and preferences you'll have to die to. And Peter didn't like that message. That was not good press. That wasn't going to get him likes on Instagram. Jesus said to Peter, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And the danger is this, please get this, that if we're not careful, we create a version of Jesus that's too safe and too comfortable and too predictable. What do I mean? That the Jesus you're following you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta investigate this. You gotta look closely. Is the Jesus you're following there to cater to your needs rather than you to his mission? Imagine Peter getting so comfortable, getting comfortable enough to put his arm around Jesus. Pull him aside from the crowd, from his teaching. Look him in the eye and say, you're doing it wrong. I've got a better way. It's painless. It's more popular. There's less obstacles. There's opulence and fame and comfort and conquest. We can get through this together and I can keep you alive. And Jesus says, you obviously have no idea what God's up to. No wonder Jesus stated earlier, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. So what does Jesus do next? He wants to provide a living illustration. He, right after this situation happens, shortly after, He takes his elite students, Peter, James, and John, and they're gonna go on a little theological field trip. How many of you remember field trips in early elementary school? Do you remember one of your first field trips? I remember Descanso Gardens with my class, La Brea Tar Pits. And the teacher gave us a little notepad, right? And you really basically have three things you gotta do. You got your little notepad and you're gonna look and you're gonna listen and you're gonna learn, right? And you just jot things down or remember at Descanso Gardens to just draw, maybe you wanna draw your favorite flower. I could see Jesus hand the disciples three notepads, writing utensil and say, we're gonna go on a little field trip and I need you to look and to listen and to learn. When we are uh, part of a, of a men's, we're reading through the Bible, a men's Bible recap group we meet on Thursday mornings. And, and honestly, you could say Jesus has us on a walk. We're writing stuff down, we're reading the Bible, writing stuff down, we're looking, we're listening. And we're learning, we're just trying to hear and we get to sit down together once a week and just talk about what Jesus has been showing us, what God's been showing us through his, what he's revealing to us about himself. So here's, here's how it unfolds. Matthew or Mark 9 verse two. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John He led them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant and intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So let's pause there for a moment. Six days, Jesus takes the men on a hike. Six days of preaching the same message. Gonna come, gonna die. Son of man, give it all. 
live your life, you gotta lose it and, and sacrifice and take up your cross. And it's just, it's, it's just the message that is driving Peter crazy, but he gets it now. Or at least he's beginning to. And Jesus waits, or they wait six days and they move up, they go up to the mountain and they're, they're alone together. Three, the three disciples and Jesus up on Mount Hermon and he's transfigured there. The Greek word for that, that word transfigure is the word metamorpho. Metamorpho, which we get our word metamorphosis, change. Something is changing. Think cocoon butterfly. Something is changing. His clothes became dazzling white. Mark writes, uh, Mark, and, and Mark writes this down as the, the best way he possibly can. He says, no one on earth could launder or bleach to such whiteness. <laughs> like, how do you know the English language just falls short? Like not the, the best tide couldn't do it. Like you're trying to give, you're trying to describe heaven and royalty and regal and glory. And you're using like, you couldn't bleach it, man. And get it that white. But he's also, you got to remember this, he's also writing as Peter's giving him narrative, by the way. So he's using Peter's descriptors here. His face glowed, his, his appearance changed. There was a whiteness, uh, uh, like of a heavenly origin. What's going on here? What's up with this transfiguration? I like the way Alistair Begg captures it. He, he says, he says it this way. What's been concealed in humanity, in his humanity, is now being revealed. God incarnate, God made flesh. And he was peeling back the flesh and he was showing us a little bit of his glory. Vera homo vera deus, truly man, truly God. Much of his earthly walk, you saw his humanity. And we love to see a Jesus. We, we love to see a Jesus who portrays a smile. Like you, well, you watch The Chosen. How I many you just enjoy the Jesus on The Chosen? You, like he smiles and he, he, he laughs and, and he kind of jokes around and dances, you know, just with it. And you just, we, love to, we love to see that. We connect with that. We love to see him enjoying his creation, yet without sin. Much of his earthly walk. And here's what we can say. What was once veiled is now seen and it's glorious. His glory in veiled humanity. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. It's as if, again, peeled back humanity and exposed his glory. Other descriptions of this transfiguration moment, Calvin, a commentator, writes, it's a temporary exhibition of his glory. Heaven pulling back the curtain. There's a splash. It's a moment of radiance, of glory into the cerebral cortex of the disciples. And they've got their notepads. Trying to capture it. Imagine those three guys up there. If you're Peter, James, and John, you're thinking, we've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen this side of, we've never seen this side of Jesus. We've never seen this radiance. We've never seen this glory. We've never seen this external. We've seen miracles. We've seen, but we've never seen this. It was a thin place between heaven and earth, a thin place. You ever have one of those thin places? Maybe, maybe it wasn't a transfiguration moment. But you ever had a moment with the Lord where it just left you speechless? You ever had a moment by yourself in his presence? And maybe I, 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 can, just, I can remember a, a, a moment in, in college, and there's several over the years 
where you just sensed God's presence was near. It was a thin place. Maybe in worship, maybe a song. Maybe you were by yourself at home and you were listening to a song. Or maybe you were afraid uh, in the night watches by yourself and you began to pray and you sensed the presence of God. And maybe you even said, Lord, if you show yourself now, I'll be dead with fear. A thin place. Jesus' face shone, his clothes so white you couldn't launder them as white as they are. And then Elijah and Moses show up representing the law and the prophets. And, and, and one of the writers, I think it's Matthew, who, who captures even some of the conversation. They're saying where the law and the prophets fell short, Jesus goes. They're encouraging him, keep going, keep going. You're going to take this further than the law and the prophets ever could. God was giving Peter and James and John a taste of something they could not fully comprehend. And there's a reason why I'm kind of belaboring this point. It was definitely a visual reminder of the glory of God veiled in human flesh, who they were walking with, who they were talking with. It was establishing in their minds the divine nature of who God is and his divine plan. It was a reminder and a confirmation Jesus is Messiah and the anointed one. He's not your BFF. And in that moment, during the transfiguration, Peter steps up. And he had no idea what to say or do. So he wants to fill the awkward moment by saying stuff. <laughs> Why is it that some of us, we, we I, I, I find, I fall prey to this. Like if there's a silence in a conversation, I feel like I gotta fill it with something. Even I have no idea. Anybody feel that? You ever got that tension? Like, like couple, two couples go and, and you're eating and like it's quiet and they're not saying anything. It's like, I got to fill this moment with some words. I think that might have been part of Peter's problem. And so he says, it's good that we're here. We ought to build something. I'll run to Home Depot. I'll get some lumber. And we're going to build a tabernacle for you and for these two guys. And let's build something. Let's, let's memorialize this. Let's, let's create something. It's good that we're here. And Lord, man, I, I, I see, I think I see a lot more clearly now. And he's talking, he's filling the air. And look at the Matthew account. Matthew 17, 4 says, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, and one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. You almost get a little inference of stop talking. The voice from heaven says, this is my son, very much like Jesus at baptism, whom I love, listen to him. To be fair, the disciples are petrified. Through the Bible, when people came into a thin space and have an encounter with the holy, with the angel of the Lord, the reaction of the people was, it wasn't ho-hum, checking their watch, what's for lunch? The reaction is almost in every instance to fall on their faces because the glory of God is terrifying. Think Old Testament, Mount Sinai, when God's presence descended on the mountain, God told Moses, don't even let the people touch the mountain, they'll die. Think Uzzah when he was helping God and he reached out to steady the ark. We talk a lot about all of these. They had it on a cart, which wasn't supposed to happen. A lot of things they did wrong. A lot of things, they got comfortable. God was a chum. They were gonna, right, buddy, and you're gonna step, reach out and steady the ark, he dies. Think the priests, when they went into the temple, into the holy of holies, they went in not only with a rope tied around the ankles, left outside of the curtain, 
but they had bells under their tassels, under their, uh, on the end of their garment so that people on the outside could listen and make sure there was still movement. And if there wasn't, they could use the rope to drag them out. What about Mary at the, at the angel's announcements or, or, announcement or Paul on the road to Damascus and fell off his horse? No wonder angelic visitations always began with, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And here at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus comes to his terror-stricken disciples. And I love this passage, Matthew 17, six through eight. It says, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and they were terrified. They, that heard this being the voice of God. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. You kind of get the idea that uh, and when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Like they were, they were in the, stop, drop, and roll. I mean, they were down, under, they were under the desk. They were hiding. So what are the lessons? Wind this up. What are the lessons? I, I just really have one statement. Be careful to study the Jesus that you're worshiping. Do you see him as God incarnate, incarnate God made flesh, or do you see him as your Sunday buddy? Your good luck charm. You get out of jail free pass. Do you often find yourself like Peter, putting your arm on his shoulder, pulling him aside, maybe rebuking him when things that pertain to your life, some of the decisions, some of the hard things? You're doing it wrong, Jesus. I've got a better way. It's painless. It's more popular. There's less obstacles. Why do I have to go that way? Why are you putting so much on me? Don't you know what I've been through? There's a, a way that doesn't cost as much. We can get through this and I can maintain control somehow. Let me say it again. Be careful that Jesus you're worshiping is not one that you fashioned and formed to fit your fancy. one who's there to cater to your needs rather than you and I to his mission. You may have heard the book by Mark Buchanan, Your God's Too Safe. He writes these words. In fact, he just recounted the Uzzah incident where Uzzah reached out to steady the ark and, and dies and David's upset with the Lord and they put the ark and aside, it, it just creates a firestorm of trouble and problems. And he writes, could it be your God is too safe? He said, the safe God asks nothing of us, gives nothing to us. He never drives us to our knees in hunger, in hungry, desperate prayer, and never sets us on our feet in fierce, fixed determination. He never makes us bold to dance. The safe God never whispers in our ears anything but greeting card slogans and certainly never asks that we embarrass ourselves by shouting out from the rooftop. He doesn't make us a kingdom of priests, only a colony of uzzas, men and women who know better than God. A safe God inspires neither awe nor worship nor sacrifice. A safe God woos us to live shallow and on the fringes and keeps us stuck there. He helps us escape reality. The safe God has no power to console us in grief or shake us from complacency or re rescue us from the pit. He just putters in the garden, smiles benignly, waves now and then, and mostly spends a lot of time in his room doing puzzles. 
Who would leave the comfortable fringes of Christianity for another kind of God? He writes, the excuse I hear most often when people continue in a confessed sin is, I think God understands. The kind of God I worship isn't all hung up about this. It's as though God were a half daft old uncle, hair sprouting from his ears, a bit runny about the eyes, winking at our little pranks and picadillos. Well, that's nice. But God isn't nice. God isn't safe. God is a consuming fire. Though he cares about the sparrow, make no mistake. The embodiment of his care is rarely doting or pampering. God's main business is not ensuring that you and I get parking spaces close to the mall entrance or that the bed sheets and the color we want are miracle on sale this week. His main business is making you and me holy. His main business is making you and me holy. And for those of us who live fringe Christianity, safe Christianity, more than holy ground, whose hearts are more slow than burning, that always requires both kindness and sternness from our God, from our God. Can we stand together? Maybe all this today is just to pause for a moment and ask ourselves: is the Jesus we're serving, is the God that we're worshiping, the one that the Bible speaks about or one that we've created? And I love the song that we're about to sing. It says this, Christ be magnified. I wanna see you. I wanna worship you. I wanna draw near to you. So Lord, open our eyes and open our hearts. Forgive us, Lord. Yes, you are loving. Yes, you gave your life and you died for our sin. Yes, you sacrificed it all. But there's something of your glory and power, Lord, that we miss sometimes. When you peel back the humanity and we see your glory, God, and we we respond maybe like the disciples, we fall to our knees and we cry, holy God, make me holy. Cleanse me, wash me, purify me. Burn out compromise from my life. Change my thinking, God. Enlarge my perspective of who you are. Don't leave me in my own thinking, in my own humanness, Lord. Change me. Metamorpho me. Change us. Grow us. Be Your word says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That that word transformed is the same word, metamorpho. Change us. Let us reflect your glory, we pray. Help us to see you now in Jesus' name. Let's worship together. And listen, let me just say this while the band's singing. Maybe you're here today and you're walking through a difficult season. We have people that would love to pray with you and for you under the prayer light to to my right and your left behind you. Uh, There's a prayer light there and people would just love to pray with you. You're walking through a difficult season. There's a God in heaven wants to meet you today. Don't leave without being prayed for and somebody agreeing with you. Let's worship. Christ be magnified. Come on, let's sing it.